I expect you to Hi, welcome back to Yuli for our second session. Without wasting any time, I would like to invite Sekolah Menengah Sains Sultan Mahmud to present their video on the topic education. You're welcome. come to a halt since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each and every sector was affected, including the education sector. The pandemic has caused an immense disruption of the education systems in human history, affecting nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 200 countries. We should do something to keep the education system going. We need to adapt to the changes and continue moving forward. The outbreak of the coronavirus disease in 2019 has become the most recent threat to global health. The number of deaths continues to rise, inflicting social isolation and lockdown in multiple countries, prompting the World Health Organization to declare pandemic in March 12, 2020. All human physical activities, including education sectors, were practically on hold, causing alteration in pedagogy. Schools and universities are forced to close. Digital learning became the new norm for educators and learners. Digital learning utilizes various electronic devices, including laptops, tablets, and smartphones. And internet connectivity becomes a necessity to support synchronous and asynchronous learning needs. Digital learning can be defined as 
the innovative use of digital tools and technologies during teaching and learning. Similarly, Vivid Desk and Lemus in 2019 described digital learning as a method that involves information communication technologies to support the learner interaction with digital materials design hub learners with specific learning outcomes. While digital learning has many advantages, such as flexibility in terms of time and location, it also has many disadvantages. Several communities know that educators have become reliant on online learning tools, thus developing new tactics to attack systems, disrupting learning, setting students back. In 2020, Microsoft Security Intelligence reported that the education industry encountered 61% of the 7.7 million malware encounters experienced by enterprises in the 30 days. However, this issue can be solved if education institutions evaluate the cybersecurity programs and the appropriate measures to secure the online learning environments. The drawback of digital learning also includes students' mental and physical health. With the screen time increasing drastically, the mind is overwhelmed with information and the brain finds it difficult to register all the information. This will lead to some fatigue, which is exhaustion after attending some classes or video conference. According to Pasali et in 2020, due to the impact of COVID-19 on the performance, abnormal stress and depression among students are also associated with increased self-injury and suicide attempts. To overcome such obstacles, students should create a regular schedule to bring order and organization to their studies. They should also choose to study sports with few distractions to concentrate decently. Parents too should play a part by setting a positive tone at home as not to raise students' anxiety levels. As for students' physical health, Increased screen time has escalated the strain on the eyes, resulting in significant headaches. The posture, poor diet, and lack of physical activities have also resulted in health issues and with concerns from constant sitting. Therefore, students are encouraged to do physical activities indoors since sport release endorphins in the body that can help improve a person's health. Students also need to consume a good diet, have a good sleeping schedule, and practice great posture. Although, the main focus is to limit electronic usage as students have seen a significant increase in daily screen time thanks to online learning. In addition, students start losing focus once they find difficulty in online learning. Lack of motivation is one of the common problems students face during online classes. Completing tasks and engaging students with their education requires much motivation. Students' resistance to change is another obstacle. It doesn't allow them to adapt to the online learning environment. Time management is difficult for e-learners, as online courses require much time and intensive work. Many students are also facing technical difficulties and are not well equipped with a high internet connection required for online learning. Dogan in 2015 suggested that teachers must have a constructive verbal motivation to promote students' academic achievement. Students need to know they will be supported in their learning process when they adopt an online approach. Another method is to give students a lifeline, including the ability to redo an assignment and a deadline extension. Students should work with the teachers to help downloadable slideshows, videos, assignments, and even exams. Once the content has been downloaded, students can access it without needing a continuous connection to the internet, making it possible to complete assignments from anywhere. In this digital learning era, students have lost connection with human presence, thus affecting them mentally and emotionally. Prevention could be done by teachers creating assignments that involve pair or group works, therefore requiring students to engage with their peers. During classes, teachers are encouraged to talk to students on topics outside of the learning syllabus. This is to inculcate social interaction between them and students. Students also could set up video conference among them to maintain their connections with their friends and classmates outside the class period. Despite the flaws of online learning, the benefits provided cannot be ignored. Implementing online learning resources can enhance critical thinking, accelerating students' learning, and the quality of students' participation. Papa VC in 2014 noticed that it becomes apparent from their learning experience. Students are profoundly aware of the changes brought about by digital technologies. Subsequently, this influenced human growth and competitiveness in parallel with Education 4.0 as the desired approach to learning that aligns itself with the emerging fourth industrial revolution. Most importantly, we need to remember that the world is ever-changing. It won't stay the same forever. So we need to make a killing out of the change that we are facing now to prepare ourselves for the changes that are soon to come in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Sasma, for the presentation just now. 
I think everyone can relate with what Sesma says that students start to lose focus once they find difficulty in online learning due to high amount of screen time. I find it very relatable. Now, I would like to invite Professor Zaki to start the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. A very good presentation. Um, okay, just now during the presentation, you've outlined the pros and cons of online learning. I mean, you make very good points for either, either, either case. I'm just wondering, uh, despite the shortcomings of upline, uh, online learning, which one, which method do you prefer actually? Uh, and why? Because uh, I feel like there are advantages too. So which one is actually, is your preference? Do you prefer face-to-face -face or do you prefer to have online learning and why? Can you please elaborate? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, for my personal preference, I prefer to be in online learning. Well, why did I say that? This is because we are living in a world where the technology is ever changing and it will keep evolving. So in order for us to respond to this evolving technology, uh, we need to align uh, the way we learn, the way we study in accordance with the technological advancement. So I think what we are undergoing now, that is uh, the online learning, uh, is already in accordance with um, the technological advancement. Uh, for example, um, we are incorporating the usage of the technological gadgets such as uh, smartphones, laptops, and so on. So uh, this utilization of um, technological gadgets um, is actually in accordance with Education 4.0. So what is Education 4.0? Um, Education 4.0 is actually a learning approach that is aligning itself with the uh, fourth revo revolutional uh, industrial revolution. Um, so as we know, fourth, revolution, uh, fourth industrial revolution is um, an industrial revolution that includes the usage of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the smart technologies, Internet of Things, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think um, with the exposure of the utilization of device that we are undergoing now uh, by online learning, we are preparing ourselves to enter the world that is technological-centered. So when we are already uh, familiar with the utilization of the gadgets, we, I think we students um, stand a better chance uh, to secure a place for us in the industries in the future, uh, which utilize uh, the cyber, cyber physical systems um, in almost all over the industry. So that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Pauki to ask another question. Okay, thank you, moderator. I think uh, about the online learning always is an interesting topic since we are still transition from pandemic to endemic, and definitely the online learning will be continue at certain level, certain point. So uh, my questions to the um, to Hana. Uh, just now speaker have mentioned about uh, the the amount of the screen time increasing. And uh, undeniable actually related to the screen dependency is also linked to addition. So they miss the gadget additions or maybe indirectly the game additions and some students even online learning, teacher teaching online, but behind they watch YouTube and they play game and so forth. So uh, do you like to comment on that? Okay, so regarding, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so regarding the screen time, I think, uh, like I said just now, we are living in the world where the technological, uh, with the, where the technology is ever evolving and it will keep evolving. So I think uh, it is quite inevitable for us to, um, to eliminate the usage of the device, to, to like, um, 
uh, to reduce our screen time very drastically compared to uh, before. So I think uh, what we need to do is we need to balance between um, the time with our devices and the time for us to do anything else. Since uh, we know that uh, increasing screen time bring lots of um, bad, uh, lots of downside to our health. So we need to also uh, incorporate any other physical activities. For example, we can take um, a walk uh, when we are not uh, when we are not in our uh, online classes, or maybe we can just um, log off from the devices and engage in another activities that doesn't involve the usage of the device. That is my answer. Thank you. Now. I would like to invite from the opposing team, Kulit Shaya Sansai, to ask one question. Hello, am I audible? Can I be um, heard? I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, hello, can I be heard? Hello? Okay, yes, yes. All right, thank you very much. Here's my question. A way in which the divide between poor and rich people is strengthened in a country is via processes of negligence. That's to say, corruption and capitalist worlds, A, do not provide poor people with proper uh, devices, and even in the instances where they do give devices to the underprivileged, ends up being devices that are problematic. How would you explain that situation? Okay, so your question is that uh, how do we handle the um, device eligibility of the poor student, am I right? Yes, the digital divide. Okay, thank you for the question. So uh, when talking about device eligibility, there is a spectrum of, yeah, of the device availability, like uh, there are students who have nothing at all to students who have a parent's smartphone, or maybe to uh, the students who have a home computer. But although if uh, the student have the home computer, it doesn't mean that the student have uh, adequate access to the learning to the learning content. So um, what we need to do is that there are actually various uh, steps to overcome this. For example, uh, there are lots of technological company that offers um, that offers discount for student especially uh, if the student purchases device from the device from their company. So this enables the student to have the devices to undergo online learning as well as saving bucks. Well, not only that, there are also um, communication, I mean, telecommunication provider that offers a free data plan, for example. Uh, for example, the YTL Foundation, Sindarian Berhad, or better known as Yes Communication. Uh, well, this company uh, is actually working very close with the Ministry of Education since long ago. So, um, since the start of the pandemic, since the emerging of the pandemic, um, this YTL Foundation, this foundation, uh, has uh, held multiple programs that provide free data plans to students. Not only free data plans, but they also provide um, free devices, free mobile phones to students that come from B40 families. So, um, however, uh, even though this plan is being held by multiple foundations, uh, some students that are in need of these devices didn't get the information, didn't get the information regarding this, um, uh, this aid uh, that can help them to undergo uh, the, online learning, the online learning. So I think this is when the teachers came, uh, came to their role since, uh, like I said earlier, the YTL Foundation, for example, it is, is working very close with the Ministry of Education. So I believe that students uh, I mean, the teachers are informed with this such programs. So teachers need to spread the words to so that the words uh, of this free device supply reach the targeted student. Not only that, I think um, teachers can also submit nomination uh, since I believe that teachers is best able to um, suggest or to recommend uh, the students that are very in need or students that come from less fortunate families. That is my answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your answer. I think you answered the questions wonderfully. Um, so now I would like to invite Professor Askuri to give a feedback on the whole presentation by Sekolah Menengah Sain Sultan Mahmoud. 
Okay, congratulations for very good presentation. Uh, actually, you cover up very, very wide spectrum about the uh, online learning. So actually, we, we, we in Malaysian, we have a different, different category. We are very, very, very poor and also very rich. So we need that the differences of this uh, range make the uh, different, different, different uh, gadget and so on. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we actually you you only talking about the student, student. But how about your teacher? Your teacher also they, they need they need a very very good gadget as well for them to to achieve the the expiration of the the government uh, for online learning. But I'm quite sure that the, the the teacher also need help from the government. Yes. Need help from the government. It's not the student, but teacher as well. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of only usually the teacher is more sacrificed to give uh, knowledge to student by their uh, through online. Actually, I, I, actually the most the, the teacher is uh, uh, the age is quite is, is quite old compared to the student. So sometimes they are not very familiar with the the gadgets that you have. Uh, you are much more, much more uh, advanced compared to teacher. Uh, so, so that's why sometimes, sometimes teacher, the teacher they has uh, just prepare a video and then give it to the classroom. No, not not really interactive with the student. Actually, this is my 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 view. But anyway, the uh, actually you face a lot, but the student faces a lot of challenges uh, during the online learning. Especially, you have to have some time, a long time. It's very long time on you're stuck your stuck your, yourself on the screen. And then, may, actually, there was one is very, very stressful that you also mentioned to, to us about that. And also, the, you think that it's a lack of uh, physical, physical activities. Uh, let's say if you have a face to face class, actually, it's very, it's very, very easy. Sometimes the teacher said, Okay, we have a quiz today. Okay, let's do a quiz. So actually, this is more physical, but now online is a bit difficult to, to conduct the, the class. Uh, and then the uh, and then your 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 approach also is very good, uh, especially on the IR 4.0. And then uh, this this actually the to achieve the expiration of the government now. Okay, I think that's all. Congratulations. That's very good. Uh, uh, what do you call uh, what do you call presentation? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Askuri. I would like to invite SBP Integrasi Gomba to present their video on the topic education. Assalamualaikum and greetings. I beg to the judges, organizers, and fellow students. My name is Ahmad Atif Adaham bin Muhammad Nazri from SBP Degrasi Gomba. And today, the topic that will be discussed is regarding the state of digital education in the post-pandemic era. Today, it is evident that digital learning has integrated into education. Nevertheless, problems around digital learning remain unsolved and there are many improvements that can be made to make digital learning more prominent in students' lives. Digital learning is defined by the integration of technology into learning. This includes technological advancements such as Google Classroom, Kahoot, Zoom, and Google Meet. Using Google as a search engine during classes also counts as the digital learning. Now that we have understand what digital learning is, we also have to know about the problems that may arise as well. Problems may arise when we are dealing with something new. The first issue is the perception of students on online learning. Seeing how tasks compile in apps like Classroom, students often feel overwhelmed. This leads to the feeling of being mentally overloaded. According to the research done by Nabil Hassan al kumaim at Alia, 69.5% of students felt being overloaded by tasks. This is also due to the fact that educators do not change the teaching plans for online learning. 
educators have trouble innovating learning plans due to lack of experience. Communication is also a key part of this. One way communication inhibits the effectiveness of online learning. Not to mention, a boring teaching plan makes students engage less in the class. Students' ethics play an important role in the effectiveness of online learning too. Those who do not practice integrity and those who lack the willingness to learn makes online learning ineffective. If the students themselves aren't willing to learn, our goal of shaping good citizens will never be achieved. Now that we have covered all the issues, how should we solve all these problems? For starters, we can create an effective and more creative study plan to encourage students to engage in digital learning. Educators should be given courses on how to change their study plans. For example, uh, for, for example educators and students should join together to ensure two-way communication in the class, allowing all students to share the opinion and thoughts during class. Then, educators should keep tabs on their then, educators should keep tabs on the student's performance during online class too. This can be done by performing frequent surveys on the student's understanding of the lessons. In the end, educators may find a study plan which is suitable for all students in the class. If we look from, if we look from beyond the school, the government should improve technological advancements to ensure students and educators have a conducive environment for learning and teaching. For example, the government may provide a medium for students to do their tasks without plagiarism and cheating. Not only that, apps like Google Classroom can be reworked to not make students feel overwhelmed by the amount of tasks. According to the research done by Nabil Hassan al kumain at Alia, 71.4% of students feel overwhelmed by digital learning because of their perception of tasks stacking up. Students also play an important role in making digital learning better. Students' ethics should also be put into consideration. If the students themselves don't want to learn, how can the lesson be effective? Students should actively participate in class, have integrity in themselves, and have self-discipline with their classes. Now, imagine if digital learning got a whole lot better. How can we implement it in our daily lives? Firstly, students can make use of asynchronous learning which helps students to catch up with classes in ease whenever they are busy. Educators can record their lessons and save them so that students have something to refer to when they have free time. Next, teachers can also do a mix of online and offline learning by recording their face-to-face -face classes. This way, educators can upload a podcast that can be listened by students whenever they're free. This can also be done by holding an online meeting for online classes while at the same time teaching students face-to-face. -face. Not only students can have a flexible learning session, but also be able to learn from far away. In a nutshell, although digital learning has its flaws, we can still take advantage of the benefits so that learning may become more and more accessible, effective, and available for everyone in the future. All of us should play our roles to ensure education is in its best quality in the future. As Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. For that, I rest my case. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Itagong. Now, I would like to invite Professor Asguri to start the Q&A session. Okay. Uh, congratulations. Thank you very much for uh, presenter who said Ahmad. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to uh, uh, ask, actually it's not really uh, to ask the question, but I would like to have your view, view on the, the statement that the, uh, through the online learning, you are lacking of confidence. Once you are, once you are in the what I call in the public, for example, you are. It's very difficult for you to ask question, or you feel shy, and then of course your your confidence levels are going to be down because you, uh, because because of the online learning. 
I don't know whether that statement is is true or not. Uh, just give a your comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the question. Well, um, in my opinion, when you want to interact in physical classes in compared to online classes, there are a certain degree of um, anxiousness uh, when it comes to participating in class. For example, when I'm in physical classes, I tend to, uh, it's easier for me to ask a question from the teachers and it's easier for me to um, um, understand the body language of the teachers and knowing when's the right time to ask a question or when's the right time where I think the teacher would pause in her explanation. However, in online classes, because of this, um, this lack of um, physical intimacy, because you know we're all behind our own screens, right? Um, we tend to not know the right social cues of when to ask. And besides that, there's also the burden of every single person hearing you. I mean, yes, um, everyone can hear you yes, in, in physical classes, but when in, you're in a Zoom meeting, everyone have, you, have your voice out in their speakers, right? Everyone have um, your voice out um, through the, hearing you through their earphones. And, there is a higher chance for everyone to um to listen to you or any kind of slip up that you make or that you talk you know in your question or whatnot um, it's easier for people to listen to it and i think for that reason people um deem as online classes to be more nerve-wracking in a way especially when you want to ask a question and also there's also this uh this kind of awkward situation where you want to ask a question and then there's this like um, there's a connection problem and then you um, you will come out lagging and then the teacher will have to um, reiterate and ask again, excuse me, what, what was your question? And it is that kind of awkward situation that I think most of us would, um, would like to avoid. I think that's my two cents on it. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Professor Zaki to ask another question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Congratulations on the very interesting presentation. Okay, my question is like this. We are moving towards the endemic phase, inshallah, soon, 1st of April. So after this, uh, you know, even post-COVID, if there is such a thing as post-COVID, if we recover post-COVID, should we continue with online classrooms in Malaysia? Uh, should we continue? Why should we continue? If we decide to continue, how do we continue? Thank you very much, Sezaki, for your question. Um, during the pandemic, I realized that there are a lot of things that um, we can use to improve our education system, especially with the integration of technology into it, digital learning. We've before the pandemic, I've heard digital learning and I think of, oh, maybe presentation with iPads or maybe more projects. But now, especially since we are stuck here in our home, then we are forced, in, in some way, forced to explore all the options that are available. I found out there are a lot of apps to help um, teachers and students to better uh, facilitate uh, digital learning. And, because of this, I see that there are a lot more opportunities that students and teachers can use to broaden their perspectives more than just the syllabus, more than just your typical textbook. Because I see that students can explore and learn more and teachers have more ways to keep the lesson entertaining and engaging for students. So yes, I agree that we should go on with digital learning. However, not in the way where um, we have to do it in the pandemic, because in the pandemic, since we can't go out, uh, we can't see our teachers as often as we used to, we have to sit on our screens the whole day. However, how I imagine it to be, how I aspire it to be, is for that we have um, dual, uh, dual lessons, two kinds of lessons. We have physical lessons, we have online lessons. That way, when uh, during lectures, when students want to keep up or want to rewind with the lesson they can watch and then you know a computer won't get tired explaining the same thing three or four times to you right and um i think that's a good way for the students to revise their lessons and also we should have um, physical classes as well for group discussions group projects and for you to ask one-on-one -on -one questions to the teachers especially if you have any problems with the lesson 
And um, I think it's especially good for Malaysia, knowing that we are um, we're not that much falling, uh, we're not that much behind in terms of technology advancements. We are just as capable as any um, first world country. And as we progress, as our youth progress more in the education um, scene, it is possible for us to enhance our technological countries, technological development to reach to a higher peak. So that's why I think Malaysia should stay on par with um, whatever that the other countries are doing in order to not fall behind. It's possible. We can do it. So why not? Thank you. Now, I would like to invite from the opposite team, Sekolah Menengah Sains Sultan Mahmud to ask one question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes, okay, you're so, audible. Parents are also one of the important factors that contribute to the success of online learning. So, in your opinion, to what extent that parents can be involved in their children's online learning despite being busy with their work or managing their household? We would always want to uh, bear in mind that parents are also from various economic social groups. Is that clear? Um. So oh, let me just to... clarify. Your question was how can students manage social life and um, student life, especially in online learning? Uh, no, uh, no. Do you want to do you want me to repeat? Yes, please. Do you want... Okay. So parents are uh, also one of the important factors that contribute to the success of online learning. So in your opinion, to what extent that parents can be involved in their children's online learning despite being busy with work? or managing the household. We should always bear in mind that parents are also from various economic social groups. Is that clear? Yes, yes thank you very much. Um, okay. So the, thank you very much. So the question was about how parents can help the students, um, especially in online learning, besides household activities and for the, um, providing um, financial help, I assume. Um, well, I think, in my opinion, as for parents with different economical backgrounds, we have parents who have um, who've, uh, probably learned the things that we've learned in school or they work in a career that we are learning in, the subject we're learning in. For example, if, you're, uh, if your parents is a doctor and then you might be studying biology and then they can help, they can help you with that, they can help you with your homework and they can also help their... Um, they can also help their child in being more engaging and being more self-disciplined in class. You can also help their child with homework. And, you know, it's, it's not easy going online. Um, it's not easy to uh, pay attention, especially for the younger children. I have a little brother. He takes online classes and he's just like, um, and he's just primary school. And I find it, uh, I find him uh, always liking to um go play he he rather plays with his games rather than going uh joining classes right and i think it is the parents duty to ensure that their their child is so disciplined and always in the class and also i think it, it will be helpful if the child and the parent can have um uh, a session where they can discuss homework together you know it can help with the um, parent-child bonding, it can also help the parents knowing what their child weaknesses is, understand the child better and seeing how their child is faring in school. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hasha. So now I would like to invite Dr. Pauki to give a feedback on the whole presentation by Sas Majas. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, moderator. I think it's a wonderful discussion uh, and not uh, the speaker and also the, the one who answered the question just now, we have been uh, answered it very clearly about the points uh, the question has been asked. Um, related to the online learnings just now, because this is, I think, another good, great point that you have brought up related to the like pro and cons. And then here you mentioned quite a lot of problems about uh, online learning that facing by the students. Uh, but I noticed that actually we have been discussed about a lot about like uh, the problems, how to, uh, to solve the problems and then the opportunity for the digital learning. 
But this one part actually during the pandemic, there's a lot of issue come out about the motivations learning online. So there is a critical issue, even that motivation is kind of uh, affect the students when they go back to school, they learn face to face. That motivation is that time for them to burst out the motivation. So there is another critical issue, maybe for the typical, you can highlight that. And I really like the point that you mentioned uh, just now. You talk about uh, how the parents can assist the children. I do believe that's very important for the digital learning. And some students, they prefer, like, uh, they feel more confident to speak behind the screen. But not everybody. Those kind of like the students who like kinesthetic learning, they like to meet face to face, they need uh, to talk to their friends, then they will learn better. But not all the students have that kind of criteria. So sometimes they really like. So that's why some students, they say, wow. Well, if you come back to the campus, can I just do it online? Can you do, do it hybrid? So there is no, right now, since the pandemic until now, it's kind of like always got a student light on our digital learning. As some of them, they will complain, why not we just come back to the campus to learn physically? So there is no solutions. Like there is one method actually that we kind of like able to uh, provide the best for the students. So I, I believe um, this pandemic actually have teach us a lot about the new technology. And we never we never thought that uh, our, in Malaysia, especially, we can move that fast. Within these two years, everything's online, webinar online, symposium online, and even this conference online. So you, it's, it's amazing, actually. So everybody is adapt quite well, but we just need to fix that with the problems. So uh, I believe uh, for the speaker and also uh, the harsh I think Hasha will answer the question you did very well um, to make the point clear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pauki. So now is the time for our five minute interval. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap adalah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap adalah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap adalah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik.
Snap, bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Snap, bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Snap, bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Snap, bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan menjadi lebih menarik. Team, in today's second session, I would like to call upon Tunku Kursia College to present their video. Do welcome. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to our show. As your host for today, I would like to introduce our topic for today's episode that is youth development. Tak kenal maka tak cinta. So before I begin, let's take a look at what topic actually means. Youth development can be described as a process that prepares a young person to meet the challenges of adolescence and adulthood. In accordance with the theme, the main reason why our youth has developed so quickly compared to those who came before us is because of our upbringing in the era of modern technology. The recent developments of technology over the years has skyrocketed. Hence, education is more accessible and higher education standards are implemented. In some schools, the usage of technology has been implemented when they require students to do presentations, start projects, and organize events. To my point, this very video created using our technological skills is proof of how our education standards are steadily increasing throughout the years. The aid of technology that older generations did not have. However, some people still believe that youth development is not needed for the development of a country despite the clear increase of the quality of youth. In this episode, I am going to prove these people wrong by putting forward three points, which are representative of the future, a better grip of technology, and opportunity to voice their opinions. My first point, representative for the future. 
Pemuda harapan bangsa, pemudi tiang negara. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to realize that the future of our country and our world is in the hands of youth. They, or should I say we, will soon be the teachers that lead the classes. We will soon be the doctor to console and persuade children to receive their shots by bribing them with candy. And one of us will soon be the one to step up as Prime Minister. the recent flood. They even started a project called Hashtag Project Langka, in which shoes are donated to thousands of flood victims that are still in school. You play a direct hand in the handling of the future, as we will be the ones making the decisions in the future. By exposing and developing youth on various skills and knowledge, the future leaders will be better prepared to take on this responsibility head on. The country will be in ready if not experienced hands, and hopefully with the preparations and exposures that the youth have gone through, the country will continue to rise and thrive. Secondly, a better grip on tech. The race towards technology advancement has been going on for centuries. A close example would be the space race that took place between the United States and the Soviet Union. Even now, we can see the rapid changes and improvement of the technology we use in our daily lives such as smartphones. Being raised during the Industrial Revolution 4.0 in Malaysia, current youth has spent almost the entire childhood and teenage years growing up with technology as a constant in their life. This comes with the advantage that you have a better grip on technology and a wider range of knowledge to be accessed. This important knowledge could be later used in order to help them in the future from many aspects. Malala Yousafzai once said that education is education. We should learn everything we can and then choose on which path we should follow. Youth that are raised with technology will tend to think outside of the box as to create something new to help or solve current issues that could not yet be achieved with current machines. They are also trained to think critically from a young age as we can see when they are answering high order thinking skills or more commonly known as hot questions in school. They tend to be more creative and full of new ideas to fulfill their dreams and wishes that require problem solving thus enhancing their creativity alongside acquiring new experiences. Masuk kandang kambing mengambil, masuk kandang kerbau mua. Home-based teaching and learning, or more famously known as PPR, is an alternative way of making sure the students are on track with their studies due to COVID-19. This could be used to show that the youth can adapt to drastic change quickly if needed as a result of the fast evolution of technology. This adaptation towards the surroundings and the capability to change in order to overcome a problem will play a huge role in the youth's character in the future. Lastly, opportunity to voice their opinions. There's an expression that goes, children should be seen and not heard. It isn't uncommon knowledge that the previous status quo on younger generations wasn't flattering. It was borderline cruel and absolutely unfair, especially towards girls and young women. The world keeps turning and slowly but surely, involvement of youth in various fields and activities has been steadily increasing. To quote Kaila Satyarthi, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the power of youth is the common wealth of the entire world. The faces of young people are the faces of our past, our present, and our future. No segment in society can match the power, idealism, enthusiasm, and courage of young people. Only recently, topics that are considered taboo such as mental health, racism, and flawed and corrupt systems are being openly discussed. And who exactly started this discussion? Youths. As youths, they have the advantage of age and perspective. They see the world through fresh eyes and question what older generations may have overlooked. They have the energy and the spirit and that's what makes them fight to be able to voice their opinions. By being able to do this, we are empowering them, thus making them feel more confident in themselves. Handing the reins of a country to the next generation will never be easy. So many thoughts and what ifs play inside our minds, but we can only do our best by preparing the next generation for this role. The first step, listening to their opinions. Thank you, TKC, for the presentation just now. Out of topic, but I love your house. I think it looks very beautiful. And the location is just nice. I'm so jealous of it, honestly. So now, I would like to invite 
Professor Zaki to start the Q&A session. Do welcome. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, very simply, just now you talked about, you know, youth being going to take over the administration of the country, handing over and whatnot. Very simply. What is your aspiration for the country? What do you see Malaysia to be if you became prime minister? How do you want to see this country uh, end up being? Uh, what changes would you make? Do you always see it being the same right now? Uh, what uh, things do you aspire uh, Malaysia uh, to be? Um, thank you, Professor Zaki, for that question. So firstly, um, imagining a future, Malaysia's future, uh, firstly, what I would think that Malaysia's future would entail is uh, a, better, uh, a better working cabinet in Malaysia's politics. As we can currently see, Malaysia's state of political uh, climate currently isn't very, isn't doing very well. And the first and foremost important thing that I think the country should discuss will be uh, the cabinet that is currently sitting in the, uh, that is currently leading the country. Secondly, uh, Malaysia's education system that is currently mainly being uh, on the side of on the side, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Secondly, will be Malaysia's state of education system. Since currently, Malaysia's education system are very lenient on Malays and Bumi Putras to achieve uh, a higher education system, such as some scholarships that only are available to Bumi Putras and Malays and such. And I think that uh, the education system should change and include other people that are in Bumi Putras and are in Malays so that our country as a whole can rise higher in the education standards internationally. Yes. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Pauki to ask another question. Okay, thank you so much. I think... Uh... It's a wonderful uh, presentation just now. It's kind of like an eyes opening for me. Uh, it's well presented. But I have here, I have a question because just now we have been mentioned. Uh, this morning session actually we didn't mention about the specific gender on how they, they were going to contribute to the country. And just now seeing the speaker have highlight about especially for for young girl, for the ladies, for women. So I just wondering, like seeing you already got the idea. So maybe you can give me more explanation or example or elaborations in terms of how we can empowering girls, women, they, they can join into this uh, nation building and they can join in into even in the uh, politic line parliaments and in the economy developments of the country because I know that in Malaysia we still let off ladies in this line so go ahead to answer me uh, thank you for the question Professor Pauki uh, one important thing that I think should be applied across all Malaysia is exposure early exposure on these kind of topics and career paths towards children, especially young girls, since mostly, uh, for example, like uh, Professor Pauke said polit in politics, most people don't really know how to enrich politics as a career path. Like when we were kids, usually most of the occupations that are discussed with us are lawyers, doctors, or engineers, which has a quite strict career path. Whereas when you want, if you were a person who wants to dive into politics, the career path isn't really widely known or widely discussed by, um, <coughs> by schools or by um, parents. Usually, um, it's not a common career path to take and to be discussed like, in a normal household. So first of all, will be exposure to children about all the many career paths that, can, that they can take. And also, uh, um, concentrated exposure to girls and women on the various career paths that they can take, even though it is mainly dominated by men, such as, for example, the police force or firefighters. Usually, these kind of career paths and occupations are 
being led by men and maybe some girls even though some girls and young women even though they know it is a valid career path for them to take they still feel a bit uncertain since most of the people are uh, don't expect them to take those career paths and i the most important thing is exposure uh, when they are young and also said um, having them make certain that it is a valid career path for them to take The opposing team, Sekolah Menengah Sains Tengku Muhammad Faris Petra, you may now ask a question. Thank you, moderator. So my question is, youth governance will someday change the model of governance itself. Do you see this from a positive or negative point of view and extend your assurance? Uh, thank you for the questions. So yes, I do see this as a positive kind of view because you uh, because the change that youth governance can bring to the current governance is big and may improve our current standing of the country this is because by uh, our country for now has has role leaders in youth in politics such as society that can lead a current youth to have a strong holding and why they form the governance of the country by taking over uh, by taking over uh, the reins of the country they can learn from the past mistakes and improve on themselves thank you amira now i would like to invite professor askuri to give a feedback on the whole presentation by dkc just now Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations to TKC. You are bring the woman gender here. <laughs> you fight for women. Uh, uh, even Dr. Oki as well support the, the gender, the woman <laughs> aspiration. But anyway, uh, actually that, that's that, that's very good point that you raised up uh, uh, during your presentation. Uh, you just uh, make up the three main aims. You have to be uh, representative, and then you have to be the technology advancement, and also you have to be wise opinion. Actually, this is three things is very, very, is very, very important for for the development of your of youth actually, because uh, we we as all the all the people, it's gonna be sustained in our own time, but the uh, all the uh, what are called the management management and also politics in Malaysia is going to be yours. It's not us anymore. It's going to be younger generation. You just think about 10, 10 years uh, after this. So we need that your, your age about 26. So we need that at that time you just complete university. And then after that you have you have a career path and also you have all the, the ideas to, to build up the, our nation. Actually, this is a very good thing. And then hopefully that, that there is no, uh, no other COVID uh, in 10 years' time. <laughs> because actually COVID, as you know, that is going to be uh, changed a lot of things to, to the our lifestyle in, in Malaysia. Not only in Malaysia, in all over the world. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the most important thing is you as a young generation, you have to be uh, out of box thinking. Don't think about laterally, you have to think out of box thinking. That's that's very good point that we have to be there. More creative, more perseverant, and then after that you'll be you will survive in in in, in Malaysia. And then another thing that's your youth, you have to be not you don't don't think to work in Malaysia anymore. You are belongs to, to the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. So, for our fourth contestant, I would like to invite Sekolah Tun Fatima to present their video on the topic biodiversity. If you can ride it, hug it, or have a selfie with a wild animal, then you can be sure it is cool. Vote with your feet and don't go. Kate Naster, the director of the wildlife at the World Animal Protection, once said this. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, my team and I 
will discuss about the enormous issue that have been brought in our society, the captive wildlife tourism. Before we begin, I would like to ask you, why do you think the society thinks that the act of interacting with the wildlife in an enclosed area, almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity? But have you ever wondered how did the animal end up there in the first place? These collections of animals often live in spaces that are cramped and lonely. Millions of animals across the world live in captivity, be it in zoos, theme park, aquariums or circuses. And sadly, this issue has experienced rapid and dramatic growth for the last century. Ladies and gentlemen, this whole idea which for the sake of tourism led to mistreatments of the wildlife animals. Firstly, the captive wildlife tourism is for the sake of human entertainment. Why do you think the people love this tourism phenomenon? In my belief, the most obvious cause is that half of the world population now live in cities and their relation with the wild remain distant, even almost minimal. Thus, the captive wildlife tourism provides urban people a chance to get back in touch with their own wild nature. However, the other side of the coin is that these people confront to the whole notion that they are here simply for enjoyment, but hides under the name of education. Let's be more specific. Let's discuss about the whale watching industry. Based on hard recent updates, the number of whale watchers grew from 4 million in 1991 to 5.4 million in 1994 and 9 million in 1999, with the growth rate being most rapid in the mid to late 90 all over the globe. Without them knowing, this support has led to restrictions of the creature. But do they know that those performances is a procedure that requires happy sedation? Do they know that one hour before the procedure, all of the wheels were pre-medicated with diazepam? Do they know that many chemicals were added in the water which lead to the skin break for the animals? The answer is that yes, they do know all of this information but decided to ignore this mistreatment. Alright, since we've discussed the issue related here, let's go back to the main notion. The society claimed that they cherish the tourism for the sake of education. Instead of supporting the mistreatments, humans across the nation could learn and understand much better by watching the wildlife films. Wildlife films are powerful tools for spreading information about nature and animals. What's more, they also have the power to influence the minds of the people since documentaries contain scientific facts about animals and ecosystems. And this will make things clear, undoubtedly. Research has shown that even short bursts of watching nature shows can have a positive effect on our emotion and decrease anxiety levels. Last year, researchers at the University of Exeter published a study that showed this program can counteract the boredom associated with being isolated indoors during COVID-19. When Patch has been absent for so many during the pandemic, watching animals interacting physically may be vicariously suited. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue our discussion to the second factor of wildlife mistreatment, which is personal profits. In my belief, this subject couldn't see much of the view of Malaysia economic sector itself. However, we could look at the largest, the Singapore Zoo, formerly known as the Singapore Zoological Gardens or Mandai Zoo, is one of the top zoo in the world. The Singapore Zoo and Max Safari have made millions of dollars in profits over the past few years, according to the financial reports. Also, they receive grants from the government and sponsorship money from the private corporation as well as public money by the nation, which this has strongly proven our judgment before is true. Listen people, I do believe that in this room alone, over 80% of us are going to deny what we have seen for the past week. Hence, let us be clear. What my team and I try to convey here is that the real problem isn't the trainers nor the established corporation, but the demand of the tourism when the buying of the tea cats who are the one who put this animal in captivity in the first place. Therefore, our panels have came up with a better solution to replace the mistreatments regarding the wildlife animals which we will offer you centuries. Centuries is the area in which the birds and animals are protected and are kept safely in their natural habitat, protecting them from the illegal activities like poaching and trafficking. 
These are directly controlled by the government and are also owned privately by charities and research institutes. Furthermore, these are mainly established for the protection of species that are endangered, not personal profits, which all the donations received will be given to the animal entirely. Last but not least, dear fellow competitors, after all the subjects stated, we still could ignore the fact that captive wildlife tourism is a matter against animal nature behavior. We believe that by forbidding the use of wildlife tourism that violates animals' rights is definitely a sensible action to be done in order to protect wildlife animals' own health and condition. But firstly, let's know what kind of mistreatments do this industry conduct on our beloved animals and why are they unacceptable? For starters, by keeping the animals, most authorities are actually putting them on hurting or gripping chains which this obviously cause them pain, injury and eventually death. Next, they are also forcing them to do activities that are not their natural behaviour like accessing a amount of interaction with humans for the sake of entertainment. Not to forget, all of this exploitation can cause the animals stress and depression. Above all, various efforts have been made at the international as well as national level. Hence, we as a fellow concerned citizen must know that our actions have power to save these animals. If you can ride it, hug it, or have a selfie with the wild animal, then you can confirm it is cool. Such a powerful statement from SDR. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Pauki to start the Q&A session. Do welcome. Okay, thank you so much, uh, moderator. So I think it's a great presentation, and you have pointed out some um, great point and even you do the comparison between Singapore Zoo and Malaysia Zoo. But actually, I'm, I'm quite wondering about, like, since you have been putting these comparisons, so, like, uh, what have you found out the difference between Singapore Zoo and Malaysia Zoo and how, in terms of how to preserve the, the animals? Because we do know that, like, zoo is one of the favorite places for children and for the family, especially during weekends, family, parents just bring the kids to the zoo. And so now, like, if you can point out certain points in terms of like how the Singapore Zoo and the Malaysia Zoo kind of like taking care of the animals and uh, how think they can get the first place, uh, the best zoo in Singapore in terms of uh, the way they treat the animals. So can you share more about that part? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your question. All right, I think it's safe to say that both Singapore Zoo and Malaysia Zoo and Malaysian Zoo is um um that is not the worst zoo to exploit a uh, captive wildlife tourism. Why? Because um from our research, we have been um, discovering that much more cruel uh, places that exploit wildlife tourism um is. Um, is at another country, um, for example, Thailand. So um, let me uh, let me explain to you first what uh, how critical Thailand's uh, wildlife tourism um, exploitation is. So um, when you imagine Thailand, right, um, the most famous attraction that they provide is elephant riding, and that is the most crucial um, issue that Thailand um, that Thailand brings their country. Um, to become uh, so famous in the uh, in the face of the world, okay. Um, by riding elephants, it is um, by riding elephants um, in all parts of their country. It can eventually hurt the the elephant um, with uh, pain and suffering. However, compared to Singapore Zoo and Malaysian Zoo, um, we think that um, it is uh, Singapore Zoo and Malaysian Zoo has uh, factors that are unacceptable. Of course, uh, how? Um, they also keep captive of the animals. However, they do not hurt them um, physically. However, they also um, can bring them stress. Uh, can bring them stress. Um, my proof is that um, they provide activity that forces the animals to do uh, behaviors that are unnatural to them. For example, they provide um, uh, taking pictures and hugging with orangutans. Me personally, I have been there. And after discovering and navigating this topic further, 
I realized that it, it is bad because um, it is not natural for them, for the orangutans, to be with humans um, um, at most time of the day. And that is not normal for the animals to do so. And that are those are the kinds of activities that both Singapore uh, and Malaysian Zoo provide. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Professor Asguri to ask another question. Okay, congratulations for uh, STF uh, to give a very good presentation. Uh, uh, actually, I would like to, uh, to point out here, here um, as you know that now, nowadays, nowadays uh, most of the people from a rich country, from rich country, they use uh, tigers, elephant, bear as their pet, actually, their pet. So many they are living together with them. Uh, can you comment on this matter? Is it appropriate or so it shouldn't be like that? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Of course, to me, it's not uh, appropriate. Why? Because they are wildlife animals. They belong in the forest. They are undomesticated animals that do not belong with humans, with us humans. Um, um, I think uh, if some of the arguments that have been brought up uh, to think that, oh, we can train them, we can tame them, they can be um, as friendly uh, as they can with us. Um, sure, we have seen um, uh, pictures or cases or even incidents um, proves that um, probably um, lions or tigers can be friendly with uh, some of the handlers. However, it, it is also possible for them to come back to their own natural behavior, which is what? Which is being, um, which is being um, wild. So eventually, by um, having them as pets, uh, even though after numerous times of trainings and taming them, they might cause you um, unnecessary accidents. They might cause you, they might um, claw you or even probably cause you to die. Right? So that is uh, my take on your question. Now, I would like to invite from the officing team, Sekolah Sultan Alam Shah to ask one question. Hello, am I audible? Yep. All right. In the current world, you see that wildlife tourism is very, very important in a lot of countries because wildlife tourism brings a lot of uh, realization towards communities and, and many different uh, governments all around the world. When people go to zoos, they see, oh, we must protect these animals. We must protect them. And But your side is really going against the whole uh, banning of wildlife tourism. And... Uh, and with this, you're literally bringing down a whole economic side of many, many countries in the status quo. So, and also, uh, zoos in the, in, in the current state are very much well-educated about how to treat these animals. And most zoos have good intentions to protect these animals and bringing impact so that these animals are protected. So what is, uh, what my question is, is why exactly are you going against this whole wildlife tourism, even though it has many pros? All right, thank you. So, however, if you uh, observe clearly from our presentation, we are not going clearly against wildlife tourism because why? We are providing you with alternatives um, that is also that is also providing humans um, to be able to connect with animals. Um, from our video presentation, we have provided you that we need to implement the conduction uh, of sanctuaries. So from our idea, we think that uh, instead of building um, building a place that keeps uh, their animals and uh, uh, that keeps animals as an entertainment to receive profits, sanctuaries can also be um, an alternative for that by providing a place where the animals can still roam around freely and have visitors to visit them and probably um, uh, and probably feed them but um, the animals have the have their own accountability to go uh, to go to to go to the human nearby to receive the food um, i have i have proved that from 
uh, Boon Lots Elephant Sanctuary. They provide a wild, uh, a wide field uh, where they put the elephants there, uh, and humans can still visit. Tourists can still visit, and they can still um, uh, take pictures and feed them. However, um, we are still taking responsibility by having uh, an the animals to have the rights to go there or, or to not because because of, of the wild field of uh, surrounding. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nisa. Now, I would like to call upon Professor Zaki to give a feedback on the whole presentation by Sekolah Tun Fatima just now. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, first and foremost, I want to say congratulations on discussing this topic. It is actually such an advanced topic. It's actually such an advanced topic. And also, it actually, it's actually a very current topic, which is even uh, you know, hotly debated now on so many uh, dimensions. It's good that you uh, talk about it, uh, that you create awareness about it, uh, because uh, there are so many multifaceted views on the matter that is uh, being discussed right now. I think, for example, if you go to the UK, uh, if you go to the European countries, they are not really looking at, you know, uh, establishing more zoos. Because as you said, you're keeping the animal in captivity when they should be in the wild. Even on the matter of wildlife sanctuaries, so-called wildlife uh, sanctuaries, uh, there was this very, just recently, very uh, controversial uh, sanctuary, tiger sanctuary in the US. Uh, uh, you can watch the show on Netflix that is called Tiger King. The issue is not the sanctuary itself. The issue is how do you make sure that the human beings, the people taking care of the sanctuary don't, don't uh, take advantage of the animals? Because purportedly, in some cases, you know, in these kind of so-called sanctuaries, uh, uh, these sanctuaries, they get a lot of money from visitors going to go see the tigers and whatnot. But then that money, and they generate a lot of exorbitant income, they don't give enough food to the tigers. And the tigers become malnourished. And they become very rich. And they go, and they go enjoy and they go party with their money. You see, but on the pretext of making it into a sanctuary. Uh, just now, you know, some of you use the Netflix team, and you can go watch on Netflix. The, the show is called uh, Tiger King. Tiger King. Maybe after this, you, you can watch. Huh? And in fact, that, what happened to that guy was he ended up uh, in prison on a purported attempted murder charge. It went up to that level. Uh, you go you go on Netflix. It's called, like, he's he's in, in jail now for attempted uh, uh, murder. Can you imagine that? Uh, he, went, he went, went up to that because there was this what I call this uh, 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 internal bickering uh, among themselves. Huh? And then also, if you remember, a few years ago, there was also an issue of a sanctuary in, in Joho. Uh, you can Google it. Lah, after this, lah. It, it was a private zoo. Eventually, it was, it was closed down. So anyway, good presentation to STF. Uh, good presentation. And it's a very current topic, a very, uh, very relevant topic that is now being discussed and on so many levels. Good. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor. So now it's time for our five-minute interview. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih menarik.
bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih menarik. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih menarik. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih menarik. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap telah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih menarik. Welcome back. So, for our second last presenter, I would like to invite colleague Shaya Sansai to present their video. Do welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no surprise that quality education is seen as one of the top four sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. Education is so prominent that it becomes one of the biggest drivers for sustainable and economic growth for our future. Hello, my name is Omar and I am the representative from College Yes and Sa'at and I'm here to talk about this topic. Two years ago, the world had went south. Everyone closed their doors in fear of the new virus that had emerged. As a consequence, the youth, the people of tomorrow, were all unable to attend school because of the new lockdown order that had been imposed. Instead, they all resorted to a phase of online learning. A year had passed and we entered 2021. You wanted to see if online learning was effective or not. Turns out, it 
didn't really go as we expected. And this was all due to digital divide. The digital divide issue is no stranger to us. As privileged people, it's easy for us to just disregard the problems that's happening in the B40 and M40 category of the population. Though Malaysians, 90% of them own smartphones, it doesn't really prove much about their digital literacy or accessibility to the internet. Listen to the stories of people who would climb trees just for them to do an exam online. This is digital divide and sometimes the rural areas are badly and severely affected by it. Factors such as generational differences and education quality. Firstly, what do we mean by generational differences? Generally, a student's experience in using the internet is different, most likely higher than a teacher who has zero experience in video calling. This difference between experiences causes teachers to not be able to teach as well. This also relates to education quality. Sometimes, online learning does not appeal to every subject that students learn. Sometimes, it might cause a lack of hands-on skills, such as in lab work, or maybe if you want to do woodwork, and it becomes almost impossible to appeal to these certain subjects. It should be clear by now that it is only principally just if we were to advocate in helping solve these problems in society. Fortunately, there are already solutions in helping address this problem. Awareness and donation bodies have been created by individuals as a collective effort to help in assisting the underprivileged. This is combined with the government giving national funding cheaper goods as well as tax exemptions in order to provide the B40 and M40 citizens with devices to properly connect to the internet. The amount of drawbacks from online learning sometimes curtains the vast potential opportunities that might come with online learning. We have to realize that this isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Compare this if the push for innovation didn't exist for us today. This competition is proof on why this push for innovation is important in our lives. If not, we would have all been joining a video call with no video at all. We also must take into account examples such as public speaking competitions, robotics, or even debates that probably could not be done face to face anymore because of the dangers that is happening in this world right now. The push for innovation also solves the problem of education quality. What do you mean by this? The fact that I can search up on Google and get way more results than if I were to rely on books and have to memorize the facts inside of these books shows that there are benefits and it really is effective, the idea of online learning. Other examples of innovations can also include SnapEd. Students are able to turn in their homework no matter where they are in the country. So the reward system in these apps also helps to train the students' discipline and ensures that they can actually send in their homework in this set amount of time. We can even go so far to talk about hybrid classes, meaning that we combine both physical classes with the new elements of online learning to create the best education system for us. For example, the implementation of this TV in a classroom to ensure that no workbooks would then be needed for students who might just not be able to afford it. Instead, they can just uh, do their work here, maybe even snap a picture, screenshot it at one point in order for their future references. Secondly, we can also talk about teachers recording their face-to-face -face classes in order for students who aren't able to attend um, their classrooms. We can also talk about quiz apps, such as Quizzes or Kahoot, in order to simulate uh, tests or pop quizzes. Um, so that students, with the fun concept um, at play, they are more interested and more intrigued. Ladies and gentlemen, we now enter 2022. And from a complete reform to how our education system works, to even a difference in the way we express ourselves face to face, suffice to say, a lot has changed for the better. We can see it that online learning does have its drawbacks, and plenty, in fact. However, the boundaries of technological advancement is endless, 
Heck, we might even have artificial intelligence teaching us way better than humans can now, in the future. Don't you think it's getting a bit too dark here? Sure, PDPR might be ending soon. However, there have been so many opportunities because of this lockdown that we can't bear to just dispose of when it's over. The success of PDPR is so vast and so huge to the point that it might just prove to us that implementing online elements into traditional learning might just be the next big thing. Besides, don't you think it might be time for a little bit of change? Thank you, College Chair and Sai. I love that you are being empathetic and sensitive and mentioned that not everyone is privileged enough to go through digital learning without any concern. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Pauti to start the Q&A session. Do welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we are still talking about the digital learning, the online learning. So it's a huge topic for this uh, today and this evening. Okay, uh, I think just now speaker have point out a few points, especially when you start the video related to the difference between B40 and M40. And then you say 90% of people on handphone, but it doesn't mean like, um, like uh, everybody have the handphone. It doesn't mean like everybody fully utilize or maybe everybody have the advantages to use that for the learning purpose. And here, actually, when you're talking about uh, this the article, talking about the student answer the exam questions on the tree, I think it's kind of brought back the memory of me, uh, the students from Sarawak, Sabah, Sarawak. There's a lot of students that are in the remote area. So definitely, I will tell you a lot of students that don't have the internet connections, not even have the devices, not, not talking about the devices, but no internet connection at all. And during the pandemic, basically there's no way for them to connect when the, uh, the school closing down. So here, um, I, my question is that like for you guys, because uh, you guys still are students, and when you put yourself into their shoes, like as a peer, how can we assist our friends in order for them to not left behind, especially during the pandemic and we were going to Get, get into anatomy. So people still struggling. The struggle is real. So how can you as a peer, you can assist your friends in order for them to learn together, for them to catch up with this digital learning, with this online learning, then they will not left behind. Thank you. All right, thank you for that question, doctor. Few responses to this. There are several ways for us to essentially create this bargaining power that will help these people who are underprivileged in our society. That is to say, it can exist either internally, that's to say we ensure that uh, the government uh, and, and people in authorities are better enough at doing their job, uh, or, or better enough at pro in providing these like certain things for the uh, underprivileged people. And secondly, it can also exist externally. That's to say, we ensure that um, certain foundations that are non-government uh, such as the NGOs or even uh, together uh, as collective bargaining power externally, we ensure that these problems are, uh, are going to be okay. What do we mean by the part of internally uh, ensuring these things happen, right? So this means such as voting in government governments that ensure that education is given to everyone in our society and ensure that that promise is being kept. So in, uh, in as a society, uh, collectively, we ensure that uh, these, uh, these certain policies that might be more advocative towards the underprivileged are properly um, resolved, right? So, uh, so these problems are properly resolved. Secondly, on the external factor, what do we mean by this? This can, this can mean either for forcibly going uh, and, and protesting against uh, these people in authority to ensure that these people uh, in the underprivileged are better, um, are better uh, advocated for. That, uh, for example, in countries such as South Africa, where these students uh, barge into parliament to ensure that uh, to ensure that the government does 
uh, uh, input policies that are important for the students, um, even though they claim that they didn't have enough money. So these external forces are justified for these students um, to do. What else do we mean by collective uh, by the external collective power? We can say that these people uh, that these people can uh, fund NGOs such as the YTL Foundation that was that was talked about uh, that was talked about to ensure that these people are properly advocated. All right. So as um so as a peer uh, as a peer we mean that collectively we uh means that everyone does um, does uh, they play their part to ensure that these people are properly advocated for other things that we can do as well is to is to fund is, uh, donate and fund towards these people as well uh, also funding and supporting things such as internet cafes or libraries to ensure that people who want to learn can properly learn um, can properly learn for these uh, to uh, can properly learn through online right also a uh, hybrid classes like I've said before in my speech can also be performed such as recording classes or taking in notes and telling them, um, telling them or screenshotting uh, and teaching them back uh, once they are uh, once the class is already over, right? So all these reasons, any form of um, essential help can be beneficial towards these people, and we and it's extremely essential and important. So with that, um, never prouder to thank you for that question and and the answer. Thank you. Now, I would like to call upon Professor Askuri to ask another question. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentation uh, that your college has uh, on Actually, uh, me, actually, I, I'm, 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 I'm a lecturer last time. I'm from UTP lecturer. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, this point is valid or not, but but I quite quite worried about the PDPR student that's jumped to the university and they start to have a face to face program. Uh, I think it's starting this year. I think we we cannot get a statistic. Maybe maybe by next year we get a statistic that uh, how the performance or competency of the student uh, from the PDPR. So actually, this is. Uh, everything in limbo anyway. We don't know exactly the the whether the knowledge gained from the PDPR is uh, appropriate for the learning in a university. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate for this? Maybe you can maybe you can judge something uh, that you can share to us. Okay. Thank you very much. Um. All right. Before I move on, can I um can the question be repeated? Okay, actually now, actually this is my worry. My worry, actually, my worry here is a as a Malaysian, as a Malaysian, you you get the knowledge from a PDPR in school, then after that you jump to your university, with a physical face to face. Whether knowledge that you gain from the PDPR is is applicable to the university later on, maybe there is a. Uh, education gap or something like that, but of course now we cannot we cannot we cannot tell anything uh, because we're going to start this year. Maybe the statistic we can out maybe next year the the performance of the student. Uh, can can you elaborate a little, a little bit about it? Or you can can I understand the, my 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 view? All right, I see. actually I would like you. It's not question anyway. It's a, like a comment comment from because you are going to be uh, jump to university. For another two years time, all right. All right. Thank you for that. Um. So the exact logic behind that question was about whether or not these students who learn in PDPR can essentially be good, uh, theoretically when they turn into uh, when they go to university, right? So few things that you want to talk about. Um. Um, firstly, I will talk about what I have already talked about. Yeah, what I've already uh, mentioned in my speech as a way of trying to um trying to better the way of learning in universities from hybrid classes, as well as secondly, um, some uh, theoretical points of view uh, from me itself, right? Firstly, what have I already talked about in my speech? So, as I've already talked about, video conferencing has been, uh, video conferencing in and of itself and online learning um, can be implemented into, uh, in the elements of online learning can be implemented into face-to-face -face, uh, classes. That's to say, not like necessarily the TV that we talked about in our speech, uh, that in our speech earlier, but also it could also be just um, mainly having um, projecting your laptop screen or ensuring that students have 
proper access to things such as um, for, uh, such as tablets um, that are run either by the school in existing computer labs or just uh, funding from the school in and of itself. So these things, uh, these things, knowing that there is an there was an article talking about why college workbooks seem to be a bit too expensive for these people anyway. Uh, we can ensure that um, a the problem of um, these workbooks being too expensive for people who are underprivileged can be um, solved and advocated for. Um, also, secondly, we can uh, secondly we can allow for these uh, university people uh, when they live in things such as uh, when they live in places such as a dorm, such as their dormitory and whatnot, at least uh, when they are un unable to attend these classrooms, they are still able to like learn and still benefit from these from, from the lessons uh, in and of itself, right? So then secondly, uh, about my views on the university, um, on, the, on the fact of people going to university and their skills being deduced, right? So a um, few things, why will that not essentially happen? Um, firstly, uh, we can uh, we can still assume that these people who learn in PDPR and know that they want to proceed into their future has to uh, has to enable their discipline to be able to adapt to the uh, to the to like university life and adapt to the PDPR that's happening. Right, we've gone through three years of this problem. They should have already. Uh, uh, um, there should be some form of adaptation that um, that are that is applied in learning. Right, so that's the um, that's the first part of why it won't happen. Uh, secondly, even if it does happen, why is it the harms are mitigated? with online learning. So we, the reason why uh, the harms are mitigated with online learning is a debate on comparatives. What do we mean by this? Comparatively, if we didn't have online learning as PDPR right now, and we expected students to essentially adapt without, uh, without these skills in the first place, we tell them that at least they still have um, the education provided to them, uh, provided to them even in, when they turn into universities, right? Uh, uh, even, in, even in hybrid classes, we can tell them that, uh, uh, we can, even in hybrid classes, we can still argue on the fact that um, at least there is still a form of education that might happen. Um, and we, we might consider that the complete student um, skill level being deduced won't be as much, uh, won't be as much because of these, uh, because of the online learning elements that have been inputted, right? So um, thirdly, even if like this, the student skill level is deducted, we can still trade that off for the idea that PDPR is a, is a benefit in and of itself, right? And there are still benefits that are, that are Put into PD, uh, that are put into um, this PDPR learning that can uh, that uh, like I've said can be implemented into university life, but also um, but also the fact that these people can still learn is a good in and of itself. And I feel as though um, and I feel and I feel as though uh, compared compared to people who are underprivileged, it's okay. So yeah, with that, um, I guess as a summary of my responses. Um, some of my responses that there is not much to worry about when you enter university life when you learn from PDPR and um, yeah it I feel as though it's a good idea that uh, universities are going to go face to face and are uh, uh, and even if it's combined with online learning elements it's still okay and yeah I hope that answers the question. Thank you, SBP Integrasi Gomba. You may now ask one question to the opposing team. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So my question to you is, uh, in your video, you explained that how there are NGOs that help under, underprivileged students, but why, are still, why is there still digital divide right now, as we speak right now? It is clear that help and donors from other people aren't enough. And how and when can we end reliance on NGOs to help the underprivileged? All right. Um, thank you for that question. The exact logic is behind why is it that there are still harms that happen and, uh, and why is it that uh, our idea of NGOs is uh, not a good idea in helping people under uh, digital uh, underprivileged and uh, people who are underprivileged having this digital divide, right? Firstly, why is it that, not, that that is not the case, right? We tell you that uh, we tell you that these NGOs are already people on the ground that are trying to fix the problems that are happening in uh, in this world in uh, already happening in like uh, existing governments here, right? That's to say, the idea of um things such as corruption or people being in debt that still ha that still occur. These NGOs are people who are on the ground still trying to help, and it's it actually does happen, right? That's the, um because these free phones that are being given, these articles that tell them that there are that about thousand plus students that do uh, that do gain um, tablets. We tell them that. Um, it uh, we tell them that 
these NGOs not doing that good of a job isn't necessarily the case, right? So secondly, even if these um even if the NGOs don't do much of uh, much of an impact, right? We tell you how it still mitigates this harm, right? So these NGOs are uh, don't really uh, aren't necessarily people who just give money towards these people, right? So um, um, even if we were to argue on the fact that NGOs do give money, it still mitigates the fact. Uh, it still mitigates the fact comparatively as compared to if they didn't, uh, if they didn't apply this policy, uh, if they didn't apply this whatsoever, right? There's no certain counter policy under that side that might tell you on why, uh, on why, and uh, what an alternative NGOs can do, right? So these NGOs are at least a certain um, factor that helps these underprivileged people in uh, in ensuring that education is being given to everyone, right? It's at least an attempt. That might be okay, and and if you want to compare it to other alternatives such as relying on the government or protesting against the government, that might but might just put fuel more to the fire towards people who are uh, uh, who are underprivileged, right? So secondly, on uh, uh, secondly on the idea of NGO uh, NGOs existing in a spectrum, right? So what do we mean by this? These NGOs can also create thing uh, can also create um. In, uh, incentives or innovate innovations that might help people um, uh, through education quality problems, right? That's to say, the American American Chemist Society that creates these chemistry apps for uh, that creates these chemistry lab simulators for these people's uh, for these people's uh, for people to essentially learn uh, chemistry even if they are at home, right? So these NGOs are people who are still helping and doing good for these people, right? Even if it isn't beneficial, and we tell you that. Uh, and we tell you that that's quite a minority of cases that happen in our world today. Um, I, uh, um, uh, we tell you that it is still a good thing that these NGOs are doing their, their job and playing their part in helping these people, uh, in helping the underprivileged, uh, in helping the underprivileged of the country, right? So um, once again, a debate on comparatives where it uh, where it's better instead of a counter policy um, where we have to uh, rely on fully just government organizations uh, and individual fundings in and of itself, right? So yeah, that's my response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Now, I would like to invite Professor Zaki to give a feedback on the whole presentation by colleagues Shia and Saad just now. Okay, thank you very much. Very good presentation by KYS and very good response from Omar. Omar, you'll make a good lawyer one day. <laughs> very good. Very, uh, very good in putting forward uh, your points. Huh? So I like the way you... Uh, discuss the pros and cons of uh, GDPR, and the online learning, the digital divide. And I like that you explore both parts. I guess the, the biggest allure of having online learning is the convenience, isn't it? That is, that, that, that's the biggest allure, it's, it's convenient. And uh, yeah, sure, that's something that is, uh, what I call is, uh, is undeniable. Uh, of course, there are, shortcomings, there are unknowns uh, as to what the future holds. We, we go uh, through this route, but for me, um, yeah, in, in my opinion, um, you know, I'm just worried that I don't want us, when I say us, I mean Malaysia, to end up in a situation where we are discussing about whether we are, want to embark on online learning when everybody else has decided and we get left behind. <laughs> I don't want to end up in that situation. Because to me, you can never end up with a perfect situation. You will never have all the answers at that moment in time. The point is for you to try first and see uh, how it goes. Uh, of course, there will be shortcomings. No system is perfect. No system is perfect. And if it works out, if there are more pros and counts, uh, cons, uh, once you implement it, then maybe we can proceed. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know. So, but the point is, I think we should, we should, uh, we should try. And my, as I said, my biggest concern is that I don't want when everybody has decided to move forward uh, with this uh, method of of learning, but we still keep on discussing, wait for everything to fall into place, wait for everything to become perfect. At the end, we don't move. <laughs> That's the biggest danger. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Finally, our last contestant, I would like to invite Sekolah Sultan Alam Shah to present their video on the topic, Biodiversity.
we compress the Earth's age, which is a few billion years into 24 hours. Humans have lived on this Earth for a mere 3 seconds. Yet, in these 3 seconds, we have created so much harm that we are close to reach the point of no return. Like the resource it seeks to protect, wildlife preservation must be dynamic. Changing as conditions change, seeking always to become more effective. And that's why I'm here to present three major problems that are hindering us from moving towards a better future with a better ecosystem. To begin with, let's have a look at our first problem, illegal hunting. 30,000 African elephants are still killed by poachers each year out of a continent-wide population of about 400,000. So we need to restrict illegal wildlife trade as it directly threatens the survival of many species in the wild where tigers are poached for their body parts, pangolins for their skills, and elephants for their tusks. And it's pretty easy to know why. Imagine an elephant tusk is worth about 368 ringgit Malaysia per kilogram. 2016, United Nations estimated a value of illegal wildlife trade which is the fourth most lucrative global crime after drugs, humans, and arms. Let me make this clear. I want you to see the connection and to see that this is a transnational crime that you cannot leave to your passionate but thinly stretched wildlife crime officers to take it alone. So we need to educate our community lessons about how important is biodiversity, how important is wildlife preservation need to be included in our syllabus in school. This way, we can totally make the number zero, but at least we could decrease it. And our third solution for this problem, we need to encourage the production of sustainable wildlife goods such as those certified by Marine Stewardship Council and reduce demand for illegal wildlife parts and product by encouraging others to ask questions and get the facts before buying any wildlife product. On the other hand, our second problem, habitat loss. It is primarily human cause. The clearing of land for farming, grazing, mining and urbanization impact the 80% of global species who call the forest home. 15 billion trees are cut down each year. According to a study about tree density published in Nature, the number of trees worldwide has decreased 46% since the start of civilization. Around half of the world's original forests have disappeared and they are still being removed at 10 times rate higher than any possible level of regrowth. As tropical forests contain at least half of the earth species, the clearance of some 17 million hectares each year is a dramatic loss. So we came up with some solutions. The first one, we need to organize reforestation projects. This includes assessing the current condition of the land and land use, knowing which local species will work the best and having the infrastructure and support to scale seeding production at nurseries, developing a solid pre, during and post planting plan and ensuring that local staff and volunteers are on board. By planting all these trees in areas that have been degraded or deforested, reforestation helps the environment by guaranteeing or accelerating the establishment of healthy forest structure by regrowing the forest canopy and preserving biodiversity within the ecosystem. This way, we could provide habitat for over 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity, including wildlife. Hence, we could help to protect endangered species. But there's one problem. Trees are being implanted under several initiatives every year, but they still don't match the number of the ones we already lost. So we came up with a second solution, by banning clear cutting of forests. The best solution for deforestation is to curb the felling of trees by enforcing a series of rules and laws to govern it. Deforestation in this current scenario may have reduced, however, it would be too early to assume. So this will curb the total depletion of the forest cover as it is a practical solution and is very feasible. Our third solution, by reducing the consumption of deforestation product, palm oil is a common ingredient in absolutely everything we see around us. So make it a simple habit to get a quick peek at the ingredients and try finding ways to reduce consumption or opting for organic, local soil products and if possible, avoid it completely. And our last but not least problem is marine pollution. It is estimated that Plastic pollution kills 
100,000 mammals every year. So the banning of the use of single-use plastic will be very important. Marine wildlife such as seabirds, whales, fish and turtles mistake plastic waste for prey and most of them die of starvation as their tarmacs full with plastic. Imagine eating foods that are filled with plastic and toxic. And our second solution for this problem, by lowering the price of biodegradable bags, in general, the cost of biodegradable or compostable bags are 3 to 6 times more than traditional bags, according to BESF. So this way, we can convince everyone to avoid the use of single-use plastic. In all these problems that I have stated, the solutions won't work if I am the only one who's doing it. It is not only my problem, it is not only the government's problem, it is our problem. So let's tell the whole world that we need to save the nature. If you can't excite people about wildlife, how can you convince them to love, cherish and protect our wildlife and the environment they live in? Remember, if you can change your community, you can change the country. And if you can change your country, you can change the world. How would you save the nature? Thank you, Sekolah Sultan Alam Shah. I think when it comes to 3R, people tend to forget that reducing consumption comes first, not recycle. So now I would like to invite Professor Askuri to start the Q&A session. Ah, thank you very much. Very, very good presentation. Excellent. And then uh, actually you, you put it's a lot of ideas on the, on the how to uh, conserve the biodiversity uh, in, in the world, actually. Uh, for your information, for your information, uh, our wildlife, our wildlife and also our, our biodiversity have been instinct for three times throughout the geological time, throughout the, the starting from the birth of our Earth up to now. But the latest one is in about 65 million years ago, where at that time we are richness of the of the biodiversity, but I mean, everything died off because the, the impact of the meteorite in, in Mexico. Uh, so I just, I just would like to ask you whether, whether this thing is going to happen again in, in our earth from your prediction, right? All right, thank you very much, Professor. So in my opinion, we definitely do believe this extinction will definitely happen towards our Earth. Firstly, I'll give you a reason why. Firstly, if we lose habitat loss, as my presenter have spoken just now, uh, when it comes to deforestation, a lot of species, especially in the forest, are losing their habitat and keep on losing their homes. And if they lose their homes, where exactly are they supposed to go after that? They literally cannot go anywhere. They can't go into urbanized cities. They can't stay in cities as same as us. No, they can't. And unfortunately, if we keep this uh, trend going, when we cut down trees, we keep on leading towards deforestation, in the end, these species will go extinct. And unfortunately, most likely will go with them. And next up is on the marine pollution. If we keep on throwing trash into our oceans, if we keep on uh, let, let animals consume this trash, of course, these, uh, these animals will go extinct. And even plants also, which I will explain after this. So if, uh, if uh, animals keep dying in the ocean, how exactly are we supposed to maintain our ocean biodiversity? Which is another problem entirely, because then again, the uh, animals in the ocean are as important as land animals and almost animals all around the world. And especially uh, when it comes to plants in the ocean, you can see how seaweed and corals are experiencing something called bleaching, where they're losing their color, they're losing their uniqueness and becoming this pale white and not interesting. And, uh, and these corals also become a home for a lot of ocean animals too, which is very unfortunate because uh, uh, when bleaching happens, these corals die also, which then, 
uh, which then makes ocean animals lose their homes also, which also leads to their extinction. And now moving on to the plant side. Uh, let's say, as I said just now, we talked about store deforestation, right? So if we uh, cut down all the trees and we cut down uh, everything all around us, we can see a mass extinction of uh, many different plants. And as uh, a lot of people know, plants have a very big environmental impact, mainly because they go to photosynthesis, which is a process of turning carbon dioxide into oxygen, right? And because of our a lot of our air pollution, how we ex um, and not exhale, we give out a lot of carbon dioxide towards the environment. If we cut down literally every plant and we keep on moving this trend of deforestation and all that, this will of course lead to even our extinction as, pre as I previously said just now. And because even then the plants are also effect affected. And that's uh, when we cut down deforestation and uh, these plants are keep being cut down, of course, they will be extinct and we will be brought down also because we don't have a special converter. We don't have a natural, a reliable converter if the deforestation uh, keeps on going on. And so, yeah, my answer is yes, this uh, extinction event will occur again if we don't do something, if we don't do something about it right now. So, that's asking the question. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Professor Zaki to ask another question. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for the very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you touched on deforestation just now. Mm, you know, deforestation is still happening here in the country, you know, in various parts of the country. Um, and we, and it still continues to happen almost on a, on a monthly basis even on a weekly basis. So, and why is this still happening here uh, in this country? What, what, what causes uh, deforestation to happen? Why aren't our leaders, because our leaders are very smart people, some of them I'm sure are you know, alumni somewhere, uh, letting this deforestation you know, activities to continue to happen you know, um, they're very smart people. I'm sure they can, you know, they can, uh, uh, you know, think of the negative effects of this deforestation, as you pointed out. And yet, it still continues to happen. Because it's very important for us to understand that, because we will understand the cause, and maybe, inshallah, we can come up with a mitigation plan. And what is that mitigation plan, if we can determine the cause? Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the question. So first of all, why is deforestation still happening in our current world? Mainly because I mainly put, uh, uh, in, theory, in theory, I mainly put all the blame on private companies and companies that want to exploit a lot of these, uh, a lot of trees and they want to expand their uh, reach and they want to use all these resources so that they can expand their business and all that. But when it comes to these private companies, one way we can oppose them, one way we can try to mitigate uh, these private companies is by uh, education towards the public. So what do I mean by this? Because it, it, when it comes to uh, laws and uh, governing these laws and enforcing those laws, the government plays a big role in this. And right now, the government, unfortunately, the government is still letting a lot of this go uh, slide because um, a lot of things like lobbying and how money can influence a lot of people. And unfortunately, this is a reality in our current world. But um, uh, when it comes to uh, the public, if we can educate the public, if we can influence us because we are the people, we have the power to vote governments that are eco-friendly, that can support uh, the maintenance of forests and all that. So if we, if we can educate the public so that they can vote for environmentally friendly governments, these governments can then put in laws that are more strict, that uh, they can enforce these laws so that private companies can follow, can follow these laws and therefore mitigating and hopefully decreasing the deforestation rate uh, rather, than, rather than increasing it. And that's why uh, the public is very, very important when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to deciding what government goes into power and make sure that government follows the environmentally friendly way. Because in the end, this, um, 
if we follow this government, if we take governments that are environmentally friendly and they realize the dangers of uh, over-exploiting forests and seas and um, oil and gas and all that, then we can finally achieve a long-term goal, which our long-term goal is to extend our life and make sure the next generation has a future on this beautiful earth. Thank you very much, and I hope that answers your question. From the opposing team, I would like to invite Malay College Kuala Kangsa to ask one question. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? So my question is, today, we all understand that the condition of our biodiversity is currently in a very critical state. However, we also cannot deny that we do have efforts in planning improvements and maintaining the biodiversity. An example I can give you is the Convention of Biological Diversity in 1992, which was drawn up to 2022 in Geneva meetings. Uh, so the things now is which, in, is, which is in fact, all these problems and efforts, just like you say, banning forests, clear-cutting, and raising funds. It has been narrated for about decades. So my question is, are these efforts actually enough to guarantee the improvement of our biodiversity conditions? And what exactly are the general problems and factors that cause our efforts in changing biodiversity has never succeeded before? And why? Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that question. So currently, we have, of course, solved, uh, let's say, give a, a lot of solutions based on this, uh, what you said, Geneva Conventions and the Paris Agreement. But the problem right now is that a lot of, a lot of countries don't follow these laws, don't follow these, uh, these restrictions that we put on by this, uh, like the Paris Agreement and the Geneva Convention. The problem right now is how do we pressure these uh, governments and countries? Mainly, we can do this by, as I said just now, we can influence the public and ed educate them so that they pick governments that are friendly, environmentally friendly, and so that they follow these, uh, these laws and restrictions. And how exactly do we make this more, let's say, effective? So firstly, I feel like the United Nations and uh, big organizations like that play an important role in this. Firstly, because... Uh, the United Nations, they have a lot of power to put pressure on, on countries that are not uh, using environmentally friendly methods. So um, pressures like this, like uh, let's say putting, uh, giving technology or spreading technology on how to be more environmentally friendly. So let's say about hydroelectric dams for in Pacific countries, they need to implement those in, uh, they need to help implement those and spread those technology to those countries. And other than that, the UN and major, uh, major uh, let's say, uh, coalition in between countries like this can also help putting, um, can also make sure that these, for, that these laws are enforced based on the Paris Agreement. And unfortunately, uh, right now, a lot of these uh, United Nations or global coalitions are not doing this because, uh, as I said, uh, they don't have the power, they don't have the um, power to veto and pressure but they need to make they need to strengthen their effort they need to make sure that countries follow this and they have to be honest about what happens if countries don't and uh, if countries don't follow this unfortunately we will uh, uh, as my previous statement said we will def uh, they will definitely uh, lead us into a net into another extinction event and that's something the united nations or other global coalitions must be honest towards countries because they can't say oh it's okay we can give you another few years no 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 we have to start now we have to make sure that countries follow uh, these rules and laws and the united as i said the united nations and global coalitions play a huge part in this in these roles and i hope they answer your question thank you isaac now, I would like to invite Dr. Pauki to give a feedback on the whole presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is the last one of the day and you really uh, put out a great point about the biodiversity because uh, in the previously, uh, the, the combat, that means uh, previously the speaker focused a lot on like specific on the wildlife 
but this one you really put it in the in the more general way and you point out the three main points like illegal hunting, habitats loss, and then you, you talk about marine pollution and each of that you provided with a solution on what we need to do. And I really like the ideas like you also emphasize uh, for us to protect uh, the wildlife and also to protect the forest is not the only person role or maybe the government role is everybody role. So, so, but in the arguments of the uh, answering the question just now, you emphasize a lot of the law enforcement who need to take responsibility like United Nations. Yeah, definitely they are very important because they are kind of like the policy maker. They are the enforcement to make sure this policy works. But how about from individually? I think individually the uh, we all of us play a very important role. So that's why uh, I'm thinking like uh, a great ideas about the four things that we have today is about youth developments, educations, biodiversity, and we're also talking about mental health. Actually, these four teams, is, if you combine together and putting in this biodiversity, definitely it will become a very comprehensive um, solutions for us to uh, in terms of how to make sure this topic and also the solutions become more comprehensive. Because if we only from one side, like just now are uh, the questions from uh, one of the school asking about, like we, ha we have to put a lot of effort actually. There's a lot of effort have been put, but why the problem still there? It's have been so many years, what else we can be done? So it's going to be integrated insert or uh, a part of the educations from the primary school, from the kindergartens. So education is always so make sense of all of this. So um, I think this is a great point that you'll pull out, but make sure can make sure uh, can integrate more points, also coverage of the youngster. What are their role in terms of helping to taking care of this uh, biodiversity? Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Now, before we end our session, Let's cherish these memories with the photo session. Please open your cameras and our team will screenshot it. Okay. Can everyone please turn on your camera? Three, two, one. Smile. Forget the patients as well, such as eye coding, music and arts, and e explorers. Be sure not to miss all of those competitions as well. It looks like we have come to our end. So I hope that this day you have been brave and courageous in your discussion and not be afraid to express your views. Always learn from your mistakes, whether it is improving your public speaking, spending more time gathering issues or researching information. Being open to improvement is important. I would also like to thank our esteemed judges, Professor Zaki, Professor Askuri, and Dr. Pauki for taking time out of your busy schedule to judge this competition. Thank you. So I guess this is the end of it. Okay, thank you for having us. Uh, I'd like to wish all the best uh, to all of you. Uh, good effort, uh, every single one of you for all the things that you have done this afternoon. Congratulations. 
you are all uh, winners. Okay? Good luck and all the best. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Thank you. All the best, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Doctor. Okay, all the best. All the best. Call me Pak Chu if you, if you, if you just meet me, call me Pak Chu because uh, I, if you like to learn geology, you can go, you can Google Pak Chu Bumi. I just, just, just okay. Actually, this is good for for new learner. Uh, to learn geology, Pakchu, P A K, and then C U, Bumi, B U M M I E, Pakchu Bumi. Uh, so you can get through the all the fifty something videos talking about geology. Okay, all the best from Pakchu. Right. I'll check it out. Right. Pakchu. Bye. Bring your A game. Dunia pendidikan sudah berubah. Semuanya sudah berbeza. Kita tidak lagi boleh gunakan cara lama. Snap adalah merupakan satu game changer. Pengajaran dan pembelajaran akan jadi lebih baik. Submission at 76%. 80% of educators and students agree that organizing school tasks is not made easier with SNAP. Mudahnya guna SNAP. Saya boleh bagi homework, marking, semua dalam SNAP je. Siap boleh record dan analisis. Mudah saya nak pantau tugas sama murid. Teknikal support pun ada kalau saya perlukan bantuan. Based on my experience, SNAP is the coolest app I've ever seen. We can play games while learning new things and even send our works with just a few clicks. In short, SNAP makes my life easier. Good of using SNAP, free subscription, Google Classroom integration, performance report and analysis, gamification features, rewards program, and equal profit sharing with schools on income received from advertisements. Interested to learn more? Just ask Edry. Snap! Bring your A-game!